Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Gaming the System, the podcast where three intersectional feminists examine gaming and games through a feminist lens. Today I'm your host Alex and I'm joined by my friends Jem and Matt. Before we get started, if you want to support us, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gaming the system for some exclusive content. Or you can send us a one-off donation via PayPal to our email address wearegamingthesystem at gmail.com. Today we're going to be rounding off our series of episodes on horror in gaming. Um, spooking the system you might say Um, and we're going to be looking particularly at the tropes around disability and race in horror in the in the general genre whether it be gaming or films largely gaming since we are a gaming podcast Um, so we did touch on some aspects of this briefly in in our previous two episodes Um, and you can tell it's it's a massive topic because this had originally intended to be one episode and has turned into a trilogy so um, there's plenty to discuss like all the best stories indeed yes always a good (laughs) trilogy like Fast and Furious Um, so starting off then with the topic of of disability within horror um, it's quite often used um, as a symbol of fear or otherness in horror Um, and generally it's it's you know a pretty common trope whether it be the villain being portrayed um, as having some kind of physical difference or that they're um, mentally different in that they're crazy or mad or insane um, or in fact I was thinking about this the other day having recently watched um, a slasher type movie um, usually when the numbers are whittled down it's it tends to be that the characters are disabled in some way before they eventually end up dying or there's some elements of torture within within the 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 kind of scenes of of um of each of them kind of meeting their ends depending on on which type of horror that you're watching i suppose but how do you feel that horror games in particular portray characters with disabilities do you think that they challenge stereotypes or do they actually end up just reinforcing them? Yes. I mean, I do. I think they do end up mm. reinforcing them because I think it's it's really difficult, isn't it? Because the the thing the thing that that challenges society about disability is that it's different. Mm. It sets somebody aside and I'm not in any way saying that that's that that's right or or wrong. It's just it is what it is. Somebody it, it looks different or behaves differently or whatever. And I think that in our so, at a sort of very like base level, there's there's um, disquiet and discomfort around different. And I think it, in our it, that you you can understand that from a sort of purely kind of animalistic base level on um, um, when i say understand i don't mean justify i mean understand um but i think our society has built an entire cultural attitude on top of that which reinforces those ne- negative um, uh, responses and I think that as a society what we could have done is gone a very different way and as we en- en- enabled um, people with disabilities to be very engaged active members of society that we should have changed our cultural attitudes to those um, disabilities and I think, unfortunately, we haven't. We've gone the opposite direction, and I think that horror, horror, movies and games, really picks up on that and really draws on that and uses that as a way to, um, to scare people. And it's a bit lazy, yeah. really. It's a, it's a little bit lazy because, you know, the the real thing to be scared of is is. Um, harm you know uh, physical or emotional injury and it doesn't matter if the person doing that to you is you know at some kind of greek adonis 
or <laughs> whether they're the, sort of the elephant man you know i mean those two they, that's not the issue that's not the thing that's not the, the thing to be scared of yet it's really interesting that when we're looking for like a scary you know to, to scare people we say look at this person who's different who's strange and other so indeed i hope that came across no, it did. It's, yeah no, i think <laughs> like you say jem there is um a lot of society there's a lot of fear around disability because there's like a lack of awareness around disability um but also the idea that um disability is a bad thing uh, which is something that hopefully um, we're trying to move away from because it's not a bad thing Mm. it's a very natural part of being human um, whether it's physical or mental disability or both Um, but I think that horror plays on those fears of of, um, and indeed the language around disability some really outdated terms play on those fears as well um, it's almost like that person is being trapped. So if you take the terms, they're, they're not um, they're not appropriate terms, I must add, but terms like wheelchair bound, as if they're trapped in the chair or confined, trapped yeah. inside it like a prison. Whereas the opposite is in fact true, a wheelchair is a tool for independence um, and a tool that people use, hence the more appropriate term wheelchair user. Same with bed bound. Um, I think that's slightly more different but it's that same that feeling of being trapped and stuck <coughs> is something that people are very afraid of because in, in some ways when you live with disability it can be very limiting and, and very isolating but not only that it's also isolating socially and there's a lot of tropes around you know the, the lonely isolated um, othered person taking out their trauma on other people (laughs) in a way that's very scary um yeah and i think that that has very often played um in a lot of horror as well yeah because the there is there's always going to be well suffering is always going to be an inevitable part of life and the process of any kind of like disability can almost always come along with some suffering but then it should be the job of society to not add to that to uh, empathize with and make adjustments um, to it rather than just putting it into a corner and going oh I'm glad I I'm glad I don't have I'm glad I'm not Mm. wheelchair ridden Mm. being described as ridden something always seems particularly egregious um, and the reason I was looking around there because I'm looking for a fucking <laughs> pen, a pen or a pencil because I've got what you can't see is I've got fucking shit everywhere in in here. That's okay. Um, uh, there was a one of the things I think about quite often is in. Have any, have any, either of you ever seen any of the? Uh, images from the First World War of soldiers with horrible facial mm-hmm. injuries. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're shocking images to see. And you just go, that's not what... This is This is the face of war. This is the only images that should be shown of war because this is, this is the face of it. It's not Call of Duty, it's this. Mm. And back then there was being looking like that there was i think there was a there's a book called it's called like the face the face sculptor or something because there was this plastic surgeon who uh felt so bad for these people being shunned who were wounded in battle and being treated like monsters and he took uh found old photos of them and created these stunning lifelike prosthetics for them and the that's that's part of the process of making someone because what disability can do is it robs you of your sense of self and so this is from my experience 
it can very easily rip away your sense of self and it makes it very very hard for you to to remember that oh yeah you're you're there and then your disability and all the stuff is on top of mm-hmm. you rather than it's your disability and then that's then your yeah. that's you and what this uh, this doctor did was that first step of one that makes you feel like yourself again making them feel like themselves and and then it's the society because it, the, the, they wrote on in the book that if someone's missing a leg then they're a hero and everyone loves them and adores them but if you're missing half your face then people don't want you to be around children and they want you to hide yeah. away and there's that perspective on disability of there's there's good inspiring disabled and then there's there's like bad just want mm. to be hidden away disabled but both are objectively bad is, yeah there are they not if you're because yeah. what's happening is it's taking away the human part of the person it's either presenting them as this broken thing that's really scary and should be fixed or hidden away or this super inspirational thing that only serves as an idea to help other people feel better about themselves um and there's no middle ground very often um one thing i was thinking about actually um in terms of challenging stereotypes if you think about it very deeply (laughs) i suppose you could say that a lot of the characters where um the mental illness is the scary part because the villain in the piece is is crazy and mad and that's why they're killing people or whatever um you could think about it in terms of like society's attitude towards mental ill health um is so very often stigmatizing and isolating that it could drive people to (laughs) that but then then again it's also playing into that stereotype that that's that's what will happen if you have a mental illness that you'll you'll just everyone will be really scared of you um so i don't know really i'm kind of on the fence about it because it's like uh, it's hard to to explain it's just a cheap it's just a cheap it's just a cheap stereotype to go oh they're crazy they're like the arkham all the it's done so many times over isn't it you know um I think the problem comes when they like s- someone tries to do it seriously like in um the joker mm. movie which i i walked out of because it's just a, it's a <laughs> bullshit watching it's just a cartoon a cartoon like impression of what mental illness is meant to be and everyone going, oh, it's the most realistic. It's, it's it's shining a new light on the complexity of mental illness. No, you're just making, you're just making him a spectacle. Of going, oh, what long list of things can we give him that we can just have him be a crazy maniacal clown person? Hmm. Um, whereas in say, say yeah. a sacrifice, that's an element of mental illness that is portrayed really I well. I was about to bring that up, but, actually, yes. Yeah. Because um, that is one yeah, of the few games, I think we did discuss it previously as well, that does show psychosis in perhaps a more, um, or let's say a less stereotypical way um, than it might have been in a different type of game, for example. Um but yeah, I think it's it's that those kinds of games are quite few and far in between. I think generally, um, and often it's because it, it's hard. It falls back it's, on that lazy it's... stereotype, doesn't it? But yeah, yeah, it's that the the it's the yeah there are there are like you say there's the the inspiring mm. disability, and then there's the the everything yeah. else going oh it doesn't quite fit in to the narrative so we'll no. ignore that yeah. and because some some things are just they're just difficult and they're not very mm. inspiring but those are the ones that 99 percent of the people who experience them go through and 
it's yeah it's an awful yeah it yeah, reminds me actually when we again. started off these episodes telling our own spooky stories at the beginning and the scariness that comes from something not quite fitting into what you expect um, and I think that's definitely a theme that carries through particularly in reference to to disability within horror um, when we think about society as a whole and what society values that's obviously changed over the course of history and now we're very much as Matt will attest many it has done many times we're very about capitalism <laughs> so there's a lot of value placed on your ability to work and contribute to society and if you can't do that for whatever reason or that is is not possible for you um depend on with different other factors you know it could be so you're a condition that you have or it could be society's barriers placed upon you but for whatever reason you don't fit into that nice neat box that society wants you to fit into and therefore you are othered and and you know then there's this lack of awareness around it and then this culture of fear grows because there's you know we don't talk about it enough and that's when stereotypes occur and people start saying things that are clearly based on stereotypes and not facts and start making assumptions um but that's a a wider symptomatic problem of ableism in society but you can see where those strands lead to um particular horror storylines um because it's it's something that doesn't fit into what is normal for society and sometimes that can be quite scary yeah. I think that the, um, well, I mean, we always come down to it, don't we? The games industry needs to take more responsibility for how mm. it represents most things. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, as you said, uh, Senua uh, Hellblade was, is, is really, is a really good example of the industry doing it right. But they brought in experts to advise on how to do that and 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 what they and you know so they took advice just like we've talked about the importance of people mm. taking um advice um uh re- around consent and all of that so i think that there is definitely this aspect that it can be done right and it can be done in an enjoyable gaming you know, it doesn't have to. You don't have to sacrifice the fun mm. of the game to get it right. Um, but what you do need to do is to consult some experts. Um, Definitely, Jan. Which I think happens too yeah. rarely. Indeed. And you just made me go. Well, uh, I was my initial like when Alex, you were saying about how uh, the the quote unquote able bodied going. Oh, I don't want to think about mm. that and all the just just stick with the stereotypes and just going oh yeah they're a burden they're an add-on who we just we tolerate as we move forward and go right that that makes lives the lives of disabled people worse because they're not Mm -hmm. being seen as they are and it they're the people who are in that position are the ones putting the barriers up for other people but they're also putting barriers up for themselves Mm. because as i said before i i i can't work an an average 40 hour week job without becoming Mm -hmm. seriously ill and having to stop and so someone looking at me and going and say oh okay just just sit to the side and be useless and on then they'll they'll be going well what other choice does he have and they'll go well i have to work 60 hours a week it's not fair that he doesn't have to and then you go stop you have to work 60 hours a week why is that mm. and then you go oh so there's so that could be different even in, in the journey we've been working right how do we get disabled people into like society in the best way that they're able to then that will teach the rest of them will go oh i can actually i can actually do a similar thing mm. for myself yeah Maybe I don't have to do 60 hours a week. And if my boss goes, no, fuck you, you have to do 60 hours a week because of capitalism, then you can go, oh, actually, 
I actually mm-hmm. going to work with all the people I've been working with now and we'll go fuck you I yeah, want to work less exactly there's a quote so, that I really love um, from a disability rights activist um, Imani Babrim I think is her surname she's based in America um, and she's a black lady with cerebral palsy and uh, I think her handle is Crutches and Spice, if you're interested. I would recommend you give her a follow. Um, but one of her best quotes is basically to non-disabled people. She says, the inaccessibility you ignore will become the inaccessibility you, um, you inherit when you inevitably become disabled. Sorry, I lost where I was going <laughs> midway through. But yeah, it's a very powerful quote, really because accessibility benefits everybody as we've said many times on the pod um but yeah so helping to make games more diverse in that way will also help telling better stories just generally making better games and giving players more choice in in what they choose to to play as well which again we've said it lots of times but it's true so um it's a nice nice thing to think about um, but speaking of race in particular, and uh, oh Can yeah, I just go add on, one, go on Matt. one final thing to it is that the uh, gem you're saying about Senua and bringing mm. experts in things, disability is very complicated, mm. and complex complexity makes things more interesting. It does. So when you go, oh, I'm going to take this disabled character with you. Oh, they're crazy and go from there it could be really it, you, it could turn out being something interesting but most of the time it's not it's just going to be another cartoony thing and but if you go say psychosis and go that's complex and then if you start from a place of complexity then you're bound to make something more interesting so it's the same with the able-bodied people and the game a lot of game developers is going you're not only making things worse for the people that you're uh like thinking about or ignoring or stereotyping you're actually making things worse for yourself in you're making less good games you're the games that you make the characters that you make will be less Mm. good because your thinking around it is wrong and yeah there's just there's so much there's so much potential indeed thank you Matt so when we think about another protected characteristic as is from the Equality Act race and race in horror games um, there are sometimes quite a lot of tropes that border on the problematic or offensive within horror games so how do you think that horror games generally portray race and are there examples that break away from any racial stereotypes that you can think of. So, I think this is really yeah, it's a tricky one. Actually. There's I things think, yeah, like because The I Walking think... Dead. I remember has a black protagonist. Yes, it does, and and that was the one that actually like popped into yeah. my head. And I remember when I was playing it, it was because it was, it's ra- it's a rare thing, um, and. And the Walking Dead games are interesting because, despite I think if you haven't played, if you haven't come across the Walking Dead games, you might assume that they're like first person mm. zombie shooter, but they're not. They're ex, um, extremely involved and very emotional, choice based story mm. games, really, where you, you your main thing is to you know it's it's a choose your own adventure game I suppose is the best way to describe it and the character in that is black I don't think that the fact that he is black is is relevant Mm -hmm. in the the game I think he just happens to be a Mm -hmm. black man and that doesn't have a lot of Relevance, but I'm feeling like there was some racism directed at him at some point in in the in the early chapters. It wouldn't so surprise me. Maybe that I'm, would come up. Yeah, because I think that's also an issue, isn't it? When games companies have um, 
a, a black character or a, a female character or a disabled character and that characteristic doesn't have any impact mm. on on the character and I think there's a there's a there's it's not almost it's almost yeah as problematic, because it's not realistic it, is it? It a, there's going to be yeah. an impact because that's how life that's how life works yeah exactly yeah. and as when I grew up everyone talked about being colorblind that was such a, a trendy thing and I and I I it's it very much out of favor yes. now correctly yeah. and it took me a long time as somebody who'd grown up in that in that environment where the idea was that you know we should just treat everybody the same no matter what I think what I've you know it's been hard uh, a journey for me to understand what it why it matters um and to understand that you know it, it, it equity is the important thing and equity only comes from recognizing the disadvantages or the discrimination or the challenges that somebody faces in our you know ableist patriarchal you know white Mm. supremacist society that we live in how anyone who doesn't fit those stated norms is impacted and I'm really struggled to think of games that actually explore any of Mm. those issues in any detail really Um, let alone you know um well or rather that they don't even have characters with those characteristics it's hard to think of some isn't it generally yeah yeah i Um, think another example might also be resident evil 5 um which sparked controversy for its depiction of african villagers as enemies reinforcing problematic mm. racial stereotypes and that comes up f- mm. relatively c- commonly in older games uh, where you've got like native villagers as the enemies that you would have to either kill or, or who are like the scary um, enemies of a, of a game yeah yeah or more primitive yes. yeah or less less civilized mm. less morally you know all of those things are assigned to it's such a colonial Indeed. attitude really that isn't it brings it up really nicely I, mean, I, was, I think i mentioned it to you at the end of last week a book that i've been reading um about the history of the disabled mind from 1700 to the present day and i have just read the chapter on race and disability and colonialism and that whole period and it was so interesting because i hadn't really fully understood how much ideas of the idiot in society underpinned racism and colonialism and what drove Mm. colonialism to happen like um a lot of the travelers at the time who were colonializing these places had ideas of what an idiot was um and they started to kind of paint non-europeans as idiot races so whole races of idiots because they didn't conform to more civilized European ways of doing things. They didn't understand property and how to own and run a property. And so their justification for colonizing places was, oh, well, we'll come in and we'll, we'll, we'll run the land for you. We'll sort out your property for you. Because if you're living, living nomadically, that's clearly uncivilized and idiotic and not the right way to go about living your life. So we'll do it for you. Mm. <laughs> and it underpins all of it. <laughs> and it just absolutely... Well, I, mean, it, I definitely feel a lot more educated now, having read that. Um, because it, it's just... You can't separate the two ideas. Um, and I hadn't realised how much they blended together to that extent. Mm. Um, and I think I think one thing that's really interesting is that how much have things actually changed mm. today? Because we live in a society, especially in the UK, and I'm I'm not. I think we've exported a lot of this, but I think it is particularly problematic for the UK because we live in a a, a very fundamental. Well, we lived in a very strongly classist mm-hmm. society, yeah. 
and I my my personal theory is that we have really embedded that in our in our psyche in our group psyche and we find it very difficult to push back against it and we did um, a couple of episodes mm. didn't we about um, sort of royalty and and um, uh, the That's landed right. gentry and all of those things and how they're portrayed in games and how um, how a- attitudes to them in society impact how we relate to them in the games and how often the hero is is some lord or you know master in some way and that that, that there's this sort of attitudes that some people are just better mm. than other people and fundamentally in it it, this is my um, educated opinion, um, but fundamentally, this is is underpinned by the refusal for so many of these people to recognise that they have what they have by chance, by luck, by virtue of who they were, were the family they were born into, or the country they were born to, or the abilities they were born hmm. with. You know, and they don't they don't acknowledge that if somebody has a disability, if somebody is uh, has different color skin or comes from a family that, you know, has um, slavery in its history, that that means that the person today in 2024 is potentially um, at a disadvantage as a result of all of that. Mm -hmm. And that they, in their, you know, well-off families with with uh, their big houses and their land, are are there by virtue of of a different mm. set of circumstances. It is not that they are a better person. You know, Elon Musk, just to get on my soapbox, Elon Musk, who has just been given a job in the U.S. Oh, government no. starting in January under Trump. Oh is may well have worked a bit hard to get where he got may well be a little bit clever but you know he is not cleverer than every no. single person on the planet he is not where he is because he is better or because he deserves to be there and i think that our inability to really recognize that our privilege means that we have these things and to acknowledge that and to say you know oh, I was lucky I, I, the dice rolled in my favour it the effort that the people right at the top have gone mm. to to deliberately find reasons to justify why other people don't have the things that they value money mm. property you know whatever um I think that's fundamentally part of that because if you say that those people they must be idiots because if they weren't idiots they would have what I have so therefore I'm better than them and therefore it's okay that I have what I have and they don't have what I have because I deserve it and they clearly don't because if they did they would have it and then you export Mm. that around the world and with your taking your um crazy ideas of what is and isn't yeah. important and so you know and walk into a, a, into a village on you know the, the new americas yeah and and say oh well you know you must be a complete idiot because you don't you're not driving around in a carriage yeah. and you know living in a mansion mm. it, if you, you only need to take a small step back and then you realize how crazy it is and and so, yeah, we and we just see those colonial attitudes, those fundamental attitudes, which are, I'm increasingly convinced, simply an effort of the landed Indeed. gentry to maintain Power their and control. control. Yeah, exactly. And then you give Elon Musk a job in the government. Yeah. 